concludes my preliminary instructions, and I'm now going to turn to counsel for their opening statements. And as I said, plaintiff's counsel will speak first. So you already met Ms. Levine. Um, I will call her forward to do her opening statement. Ms. Levine, whenever you're ready. Jason Franklin had caught on the syndrome. It's a very serious condition. And you're going to learn a lot about it. I think you'll find it fascinating. When he presented to the emergency department of Virtual Memorial on April 4th, 2014, he had the classic signs and symptoms that are consistent with the diagnosis of caught equine syndrome. On April 5, 2014, he continued with signs and symptoms that were consistent with the diagnosis of chronic syndrome. On April 6, 2014, he continued with signs and symptoms consistent with the diagnosis of chronic syndrome. And finally, on April 7, 2014, he was diagnosed with chronic equine syndrome by Dr. Lee, one of the defendants in this case. And he was urgently taken to surgery because called equine syndrome is an urgent surgical emergency. That's what orthopedic surgeons who specialize in spine surgery, that's what neurosurgeons in our community, that's what they do when they recognize a patient has the signs and symptoms consistent with chronic chronic syndrome. And there are MRI findings to correlate those symptoms. They take them to surgery urgently. Because if the nerves of the chronic equina are being compressed to produce motor deficits, meaning the inability to walk, sometimes it manifests itself in different ways um, from a motor standpoint. It also affects the sensory function of the lower extremities. It affects the sensory function of the bowel, of the bladder. And you want to go in there and decompress the nerves so they're not compressed anymore, so that those nerves can regenerate and that the patient will not have long-standing problems as a result. That's what this case is about, ladies and gentlemen. He had urgent surgery on April 7th, 2014. He needed urgent surgery on April 4th. He needed urgent surgery on April 5th. And he needed urgent surgery on April 6th. But that didn't happen here, unfortunately. And as a result of the negligence of Dr. Sanfilippo and Dr. Lee, he suffers from permanent neurologic dysfunction of his bowel, permanent neurologic dysfunction of his bladder, permanent motor dysfunction of his lower extremities, both of his legs, his feet, his ankles, his knees, permanent neuropathic pain, which is coming from his nerves, which is significant in nature. 
the collection of the nerves at the end of the spine are called the caudic equina. And it's the horse's tail. That's where we get the caudic equina from. There are red flag symptoms that are consistent with a diagnosis of caudic equina syndrome. And you're going to hear about these red flag symptoms. severe back pain. There are many people in our community that suffer from severe back pain that do not go on to develop cardiac equine syndrome and that do not need urgent emergent surgery. But this is one of the symptoms that could lead to cardiac equine syndrome. Another red flag symptom is motor weakness, the inability to walk, the inability to put your foot down, put your foot up, the inability to actually, and this is what happened to Jason on April 4th, the inability to walk down a set of stairs. He was unable to do that. He actually crawled on April 4th, 2014, when the emergency personnel showed up to transport him to Virtual Memorial Hospital. Another red flag symptom is saddle anesthesia. Another reference to the horse's tail. And this has to do with anywhere where you're actually sitting on a saddle. So if you think about it, it's your butt up. It's your groin, it's your inner thighs, it's your whole body. Um, and the anesthesia means that there's no feeling, there's no sensation. So any part that's sitting on the saddle, you can feel. The next red flag symptom is bladder dysfunction. And this can manifest itself in two ways, either by urinary retention, meaning that you can't get the urine out of the bladder. You cannot urinate. You have hesitancy or you have difficulty in trying to void. Urinary retention and that's diagnosed by a bladder scan. You actually put a machine on your bladder to see how much urine is in the bladder. And that tells them whether or not you've got urinary retention. It's called post-void residual PVR. And you'll see in it that it's extremely significant for Mr. Franklin, especially on the 4th and on the 5th. Another way that the bladder could dysfunction is by incontinence, which means that you can't hold your room when you have acids. The same thing for bowel dysfunction, which is another red flag symptom. And this can manifest itself in two ways by constipation, meaning that you don't have the ability to actually have a bowel movement. <coughs> I'm talking about very personal and significant issues, and I apologize in advance, but these are some of the red flag symptoms of cardiac chronic syndrome and some of the problems that Joseph Franklin is still having in 2018. Either constipation or incontinence having accidents where you cannot control your bowel movement. Another red flag symptom is the sensory abnormality in the bladder 
for reference. This has to do with the inability to actually know when you have a urinate or a defecate. And the last one is sexual dysfunction. And in the case of Jason Franklin, we're talking about erectile dysfunction. So those are the red flag symptoms for cognitive chronic syndrome. And I bring this to your attention because Jason Franklin had most of his symptoms when he presented to the emergency department a virtual memorial hospital. Urgent surgery is the treatment of choice for patients with these red flag symptoms of colic chronic syndrome. The goal is to reverse the symptoms, to decompress the compression of those nerves at the base of Mr. Franklin's spine. Treatment within 48 hours after the onset of symptoms that's when the clock starts to tick, so to speak. Starts to tick that 48-hour window of opportunity. Starts to tick when he develops the signs and symptoms that are consistent with chronic aquinas syndrome. Not when the ultimate diagnosis is made. You're going to hear testimony that early treatment leads to the highest probability of reversal of these symptoms and stopping the progression of the symptoms, getting any worse. How does colic and chronic syndrome affect patients like Jason Franklin? You're going to hear testimony that Mr. Franklin's colic and chronic syndrome has affected him physically and emotionally. You're going to hear testimony that since April 4, 2014, Jason has been unable to return to work. He was a forklift operator at Ikea for 13 years, which was a physically demanding job. He's been unable to return to that job because of his severe pain, his socially unacceptable incontinence, his motor weakness, and his sensory loss. You will hear testimony that Jason's loss of bowel and bladder control can be extremely distressing and has impacted negatively on his social life, his work, and his interpersonal relationships. You will hear testimony that Jason's sexual dysfunction is devastating. That's Jason. You will hear testimony that Jason's neurogenic and neuropathic pain, severe nerve pain, where he's taking prescription narcotic medication, it's worse at night for Mr. Franklin. It interferes with his sleep. And this type of pain tends to produce a burning feeling. Very significant and very severe. Chronic <clears throat> equine syndrome won't wait. It requires urgent surgery. And time is of the essence. So the first issue is whether Jason had the signs and symptoms consistent with the diagnosis of chronic equine syndrome on April 4th, 2014, to warrant surgical intervention. The, weight of, the greater weight of the evidence, and remember that's the burden of the plaintiff, the greater preponderance of the evidence, the more convincing force and effect of the entire evidence. I took those scales and I made my burden of proving that Mr. Franklin had caught a chronic syndrome on April 4, 2014. And how do you do this? Well, we've got the records. We actually have the chart from the emergency department of Virtual Memorial Hospital from April 4, 2014. So we can see what he was complaining of 
why he was telling the healthcare providers that he came under the care of, pertaining to his science and symptoms. And we actually, it's, 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 it's perfect because we have the chart from March 30th, 2014, to compare to April 4th, 2014. Because March 30th, 2014, he goes to prison. So, we're going to look a little bit at the records. And let's go to uh, Mr. One, Mr. Bittman. This is actually the chart of the emergency department. Can all the jurors see it? Can you all see that? Do you want me to bring it forward just a bit? Yeah, just a bit. Okay. history of chronic fat issues, was under pain management but not seen for several years, so he's giving the history, operates a forklift, unsure if he did any lifting the day of onset, taking naproxen and tramadol. And it says the time course for this is the onset of symptoms reported as gradual. Onset was three days. Patient currently has symptoms. Okay, let's go to uh, page um, two, Mr. Bittman. And there's a physical examination that's performed on March 30th, 2014. And according to the back, there is no CVA tenderness, which we'll, we'll discuss. Normal inspection, there is paraspinal tenderness, there is paraspinal tenderness in the lower back, patient lying, lying on side on bed. Looking at the lower extremity, the expectation is normal, and he has a normal range of motion. Under the neuro evaluation, the neurologic evaluation, it says there are no focal motor deficits and no focal sensory deficits. And that's important, because when we go to April 4th, we're going to see an enormous change just a couple of days later. His speech is normal. His gait is normal. Actually, he actually walked into the emergency department on, a, on March 30th, 2014. His memory is normal. And remember, he's got no saddle anesthesia, which is important and significant because April 4th, 2014 is a whole different ball of ice. The 
the chart goes on. He's actually discharged home with some medication, and he is told to follow up with the specialist. And that's exactly what he does. He follows up with his pain management doctor that he had seen years ago, Dr. Gupta, who administers a steroid injection in his back on March 31st, the next day. He continues to decline for that week until April 4th. It's a Friday. Jason wakes up in horrific pain. He cannot move. He can't even get out of bed. He calls Dr. Gupta's office. And they tell him to go to the emergency based on what he discusses with them. And he does. He calls 911. The emergency personnel arrive at his home and realize that he's on the second floor. They come up to the second floor and they try to carry him out on the stretcher in a seated position. But it's so painful for Jason. He decides he's going to crawl down the steps he has in this document in the emergency room. Record. He crawls down the steps and finally are able to put him on a stretcher and transport him to the emergency department at Virgin Memorial Hospital. There is a significant change in his presentation from just a couple of days ago. And we're going to look at that chart. Can we go to um, page 10? long-standing history of chronic back pain, for which he sees a pain management doctor, presents to the ED for the second time in a week. Oops. Oh, okay, there we go. Oh, it's a little better. All right, great, thank you. Um, in a week with complaints of exacerbation of his chronic pain. I saw this patient on his last ED visit and referred him, feeling some relief, back to his PMD, his primary care physician. He reports having seen them on Monday, and we know that's true. He, he went to see Dr. Gupta on um, March 31st, and given an epidural, which helped for a short period of time. Short time period. Over the past two days, so that means if it's April 4th, April 2nd, pain has increased. And is now, on April 4th, associated with saddle anesthesia. So now we've got increased pain, saddle anesthesia, and hesitancy when he tries to avoid. No relief with his current medications. And the notes continue. Mr. Pitton, can we go to page 11? And a physical examination is performed. If we look at the physical examination of the back, there is midline tenderness in the lower back area coccygeal area. So there's paraspinal tenderness. There's paraspinal tenderness in the lower back. Pain with straight leg raising, which is significant. Pain with straight leg raising. On the left, on the right, decrease sensation in his buttock. And 
thighs into his upper legs. He has sensation in his feet, but he's complaining that his lower extremities are feeling cold. Under the neuro evaluation, it's just a little bit down. I think we just passed it. We could just, oh, there we go. Okay. Under the neuro, which is just okay, perfect. Thank you. There are no focal motor deficits. His memory is normal. There is a sensory deficit in his left hand and a sensory deficit in his right leg. And right. <coughs> patient to ED, patient to the emergency department, by EMS, unable to ambulate. Under the doctor's in that portion, it says concern for, it does say quota equina, but I think it meant to say quota equina. We'll check labs and obtain an MRI. And they order an MRI stat, emergent. page 14 and go to that MRI of the lumbar spine of the low back. And this was done on April 4, 2014 at 1526, which is military time, and that is 326 p.m. in the afternoon. And if we could go down just a bit, and we could stop right there. L3 and L4, there is central protrusion of the disc, resulting in severe central pineal stenosis. Stenosis, you're going to learn, and I'm bringing a neuroradiologist to discuss this film with you and explain the really important, significant findings on this film. Severe central pineal stenosis is the narrowing. It says at L4, L5, so that's at L3, L4, L3, L4, there's a central protrusion of the disc, and that's resulting in severe central canal stenosis. Now we go to L4, L5, which is just a little ways down. There is also a central permeation of the disc. And you're going to learn all about the tiny of the disc. It's like a jelly-like substance. And if it's permeated, that means that the jelly is out of the donut, so to speak. And it's resulting in severe central canal stenosis with compression of the cardiac this correlates with everything that he was complaining about in the emergency department. So there's a central herniation of the disc resulting in severe canal stenosis with compression of cauda equina. His low roots are being compressed. It's consistent with the diagnosis of cauda equina syndrome. 
that requires urgent, emergent surgical intervention. Right then and there, April 4th, 2014. What happens next after we get back the results of the MRI? Nurse Medicine calls the orthopedic spine surgeon on call for April 4th, 2014. And who is that? That's Dr. Seth He's home by that time. And according to the note, if we can go back, <coughs> Mr. Pittman, <coughs> to page 11. <coughs> Under the doctor's notes, it actually says discussed. Uh, here we go. Discussed with Dr. San Filippo. We'll start on IV Dendron. Q6 hours. Call out to medicine, and he will hunt. So Nurse Mamacini actually calls Dr. San Filippo and talks. And there's one other part of the chart that I wanted to discuss with you that we didn't talk about, and I don't want to miss a beat here. Now let's go to page 12, Mr. Bennett. I want to add to this list. <laughs> under the nursing assessment, under the back. Patient complains of pain to lower back. Patient described as sharp. On a scale of zero to 10, patient rates the pain as a 10. So under increased pain, I'm just gonna add 10 out of 10 pain. He's unable to ambulate. Patient complains of numbness to his left lower extremity. Numbness to left lower extremity, his left leg. And right lower extremity, his right leg. He reports difficulty urinating. So let's go back because we have the hesitancy when he tries to urinate. And now we can add difficulty when urinating. And broken bowels. So now he's got difficulty moving his bowels. thing I want to draw your attention to is on page 13 of this emergency department chart. We look under here, under the nursing procedure, which is the second portion, the urine collection. The procedure was performed at 420. It was a bladder scan. Midstream clean catch, amount 20 mLs. The latter scan performed and shows that he has 375 milliliters of urine in his mold. about what's going on with Mr. Franklin as he presents to the emergency department on April 4, 2014. <coughs> Nurse Magazzini discusses the MRI that was done 
on April 4, 2014. But then again, Dr. Sanfilippo has access to this MRI from his home. He can actually have access to the emergency department chart and pull up the emergency department chart and the MRI. He can actually look at the images in his home and see what's going on with Mr. Franklin. And Dr. Sanfilippo does that and says, let's admit the patient. Let's put him on IV Dendron, which is a steroid medication to take down the inflammation. And he planned on seeing Mr. Franklin on April 5, 2014. He does not come to see Mr. Franklin in the emergency department on April 4, 2014. With these findings documented in the chart, and with this MRI finding documented in the chart. According to my orthopedic surgical expert, Dr. Regan, who we're bringing in from California, is going to tell you that any reasonable and prudent orthopedic spine surgeon would have come to see Mr. Franklin and would have diagnosed him with caudate equina syndrome and would have taken him urgently to surgery on April 4th, 2000. According to Dr. Regan, it's a deviation from the standard of care. It's negligence. This is negligence. Not to come and see this patient with these significant signs and symptoms and these significant MRI findings. Dr. Regan is going to testify to many deviations on behalf of Dr. Sanfilippo as well as Dr. Lee. According to Dr. Regan, if Dr. Sanfilippo had come to see Jason and operated on Jason on April 4, 2014, he would have had a much better outcome in terms of his motor deficit, his sensory deficit, his bowel deficit, his bladder deficit, his sexual deficit, and his neuropathic pain. Who does see him in the emergency department? We know Mr. Mancini. We know some of the other nurses because we've gone through some of their notes. There's an emergency room physician who sees him. And then he's admitted under the care of uh, it says medicine. There is a internal medicine physician. He's known as a hospitalist. He actually provides care when patients are admitted to virtual memorial. It's Dr. David Gross. And hopefully we're going to get to have him come in and talk about his uh, care and treat. Once Mr. Franklin is admitted on April 4th, 2014, he comes into the care of the nurses at Virtual Memorial. They see him, they assess him, they document in the chart what's going on from a physical standpoint with Mr. Franklin. And hopefully we're going to hear from many of those nurses who rendered care to Mr. Franklin on April 4th, April 5th, and April 6th. So we get to April 5. April 5. The next day, Jason's admitted. He spends the night in the hospital. He, he's not taking his surgery. April 5. In the morning, Dr. Sanfilippo comes to see Jason. He actually now has another opportunity to review the MRI images, another opportunity to look at the emergency department record to see all of the symptoms and signs that were documented by Nurse Mancini. And what does he do? He does a physical examination and he documents that he's got a five out of five motor strength. <coughs> Which is normal in his lower extremities. He also documents in his chart, that he has a normal rectal tone. He actually does a rectal examination. Normal rectal tone. And based on these two things, under his assessment, he documents that this is unlikely cauda equina syndrome. That's his diagnosis in the hospital chart. Unlikely Equina syndrome. 
syndrome. He also documents question mark, question mark, question mark, urinary retention. He calls in a urologist to come and see Mr. Franklin for his questionable urinary retention. What else does he document? He does document that he has bilateral leg numbness. And he also documents that there is a decrease in the sensation for Jason Franklin when he's performing his rectal examination. You can feel it. Decreased sensation upon rectal exam. He diagnoses unlikely cardiac equinus syndrome on April 5, 2014, and does not take Jason to surgery. According to Dr. Regan, this is a deviation from the standard of care. Mr. Franklin had cardiac equinus syndrome on April 5, 2014, and should have urgently, that day, April 5, been taken to surgery <coughs> to decompress the nerves of the cardiac equina to give them a chance to heal. But because he says a likely cardiac equina syndrome, he doesn't take Jason to surgery. There were other healthcare providers who saw Jason on April 5, 2014. Hopefully, you'll hear from Dr. Azroff, the urologist in this case who diagnoses him with acute urinary retention. Acute, not chronic, not long-standing, but acute having happened right then and there. Acute urinary retention. And how does he diagnose that? He does another bladder scan. And this time, the platter scan shows that he has 614 cc's of urine in his bladder. Based on that, 614 cc's on bladder scan. And based on that, they put in a Foley catheter, which is a tube inserted to drain the urine from his bladder. And once they put the Foley catheter in, another 400 cc's come out. He had over 1,000 cc's of urine built up in his bladder. And not only was Dr. Azroff able to diagnose the urinary retention based on the bladder scan, they palpate and feel that the bladder was distended and that it was full of urine. This is at the same time that Dr. Sanfilippo says, unlikely cardiac equina syndrome. This is the same time when Dr. Sanfilippo fails to take Jason to surgery on an urgent basis on April 5, 2014. He actually learns, according to Dr. Aswell, that when Jason moves suddenly, he leaks urine. When he moves suddenly, he leaks urine, unintentionally. He also will hear, hopefully, from the nurse who provided care on April 5, 2014. He documents that Jason is in conflict, just like Dr. Azrael said, he's in conflict. On April 
fine. 2014, and his right and his lo left lower extremities are numb. Dr. Gross, the hospitalist, comes to see Jason every day. He follows him in the hospital. April 5, 2014, Dr. Gross comes right after Dr. Sanfilippo and actually says that now his numbness is getting worse. He's getting worse. Numbness is worse. April 6th comes. No surgery on April 5th. <coughs> April 6th. Dr. Sanfilippo continues to see Mr. Franklin. How does he find on the morning of April 6th? He finds that there's less back pain. And less numbness. <coughs> he orders a void trial that was going to take place the following day on the seventh. And if he was unable to void, he was going to take him to surgery on the following day, April 8th. If he was able to void, he was going to send Mr. Franklin home on April 7th, 2014. Who else sees Jason Franklin on April 6th, 2014? Dr. Sanfilippo doesn't diagnose cardiac syndrome on April 6th and doesn't take him to surgery. Dr. Gross sees him immediately after Dr. Sanfilippo. If we can go to that note, Mr. Bittman, let's grab it. And you can kind of see them together. Number 34, Mr. Pittman. We see on top, this is on April 6, 2014, um, at 8 10 in the morning. This is the orthospine, this is Dr. Sanfilippo's note, where he documents a decrease, that arrow, in low back pain, LBP, and decrease in numbness. Now, if we can just go up a bit, Mr. Bittman, to the, to the, oh, I'm sorry, down, sorry, <coughs> to the following note by Dr. Gross, and this is interesting, April 6, 2014, you can stop, thank you, complained of foot numbness is worse, worse. So Dr. Sanfilippo says that there's less numbness. And Dr. Gross says the foot numbness is worse. Who else sees Jason on April 6, 2014? The physical therapist, and hopefully we're going to bring her into the court and you'll hear about her care and treatment of Jason Franklin on April 6, 2014. Her name is Venetia Kokinas, and she says that on April 6, 2014, both his legs are numb. Both legs are numb. There's weakness in the right lower extremity. Weakness in the right lower extremity. <coughs> She documents, it's not just weakness, he's got a foot drop. Now he cannot pick up his foot, he cannot put his foot down. He cannot do that. On the right hand side, there's a right foot drop. <laughs> and 
this is the morning of April 6th, the same morning that Dr. Sanfilippo has evaluated Mr. Franklin. She reports that his entire feet are numb. And he's using a rolling walker to walk and to help him ambulate. And that he needs assistance to ambulate, to walk. There's no surgery. I'm listening. He's now he's getting worse. He's now got a right foot drop. His foot numbness is worse. No surgery on April 6, 2014. No diagnosis of chronic equina syndrome that would require urgent, emergent surgical intervention on April 6, 2014. And you're going to hear from Dr. Regan that this is negligence. This constitutes a deviation from the standard of care. Now he's getting worse. And there's no surgery, and there's no treatment, and there's no relief for Mr. Franklin. But let's put this lawsuit aside, shall we? Take the litigation out of the equation. Let's take the lawyers out of the equation. Let's take her honor out of the equation. And the ladies and gentlemen of the jury out of this equation. What was Dr. Sanfilippo's diagnosis that he charged for on his medical on April 5th and April 6th? He got that bill. On April 5th, 2014, according to Dr. Sanfilippo's and Dr. Lee's bill for the services that they provided to Mr. Franklin during this period of time, April 5th, 2014, his diagnosis is lumbar, Spinal stenosis. Cauda equina syndrome. Cauda equina syndrome. And that's for April 5, 2014. But he never took him to surgery. He never acted on that diagnosis that he billed for. The bill continues for April 6, 2014. <coughs> Lumbar spinal stenosis. and Cauda equina syndrome. That was the diagnosis that he billed for, Dr. Sanfilippo. On April 6, 2014. But he didn't act on it. It's a surgical, urgent situation when you diagnose a patient with cauda equina syndrome. You must take them to surgery according to the standard of care that governs all orthopedic spine surgeons, including Dr. Sanfilippo. He didn't take them to surgery on April 5th or April 6th. It's a deviation from the standard of care no matter how you slice the bread. Whether he had unlikely cauda equina syndrome, unlikely cauda equina syndrome, or he had caught a quina syndrome. The fact of the matter is this man was an urgent surgical <coughs> emergency. <coughs> and he was never taken out to surgery. But Dr. Sanfilippo used that diagnosis in his billing 
for his services of Jason Franklin. Clearly, putting unlikely caught in the syndrome in the note of virtual memorial flies in the face of this bill. He had caught in the syndrome. <coughs> Dr. Sandra Peoples diagnosed him with caught in the syndrome. Dr. Lee comes into the picture on April 7, 2014. <coughs> and I'm talking, this is day four of Claudia Equinus Syndrome for Jason Franklin. No surgery was planned for Mr. Franklin on that, on that morning. In fact, when Dr. Lee arrives, Jason had already had breakfast. But Dr. Lee comes in and evaluates Mr. Franklin and says, you have Claudia Equinus Syndrome. This is the partner of Dr. San Filippo. Understanding the fact that he had breakfast that morning, and if he was taken to surgery, it could be a surgical risk, an, an anesthetic uh, surgical risk, because um, patients who undergo surgery are not supposed to have eaten anything uh, for the fear and the risk of um, aspirating the food that they have um, ingested. So notwithstanding any of that, within just a couple of hours, Dr. Lee takes Mr. Franklin to surgery. And it's based on the physical findings by Dr. Reed. And it's based on the MRI from April 4th, 2014. They don't repeat the MRI. He uses the MRI from four days previous to determine that Mr. Franklin is a surgical, urgent candidate. MRI from April 4th, 2014. <coughs> Dr. Lee recognizes the body of the syndrome. Dr. Lee recognizes that this is an urgent surgical matter and that he needs to get Jason in there so that he can decompress the nerves to give them the best opportunity to recover from the compression. And now we're talking about compression for at least four days. talk about everything that was done during that surgery. But unfortunately, when Jason wakes up on April 7th, 2014, he now has a change in his medical condition. He got worse. He now has a foot drop, not only on the right, but now he's got a foot drop on the left. Left, foot drop, after surgery. So what does Dr. Lee do? He orders an MRI. And that MRI takes place on April 8th. It's number 44, Mr. Bingham. <clears throat> and we look at the levels that he had actually performed the surgery. We can just go down just a bit to L3, L4, there is a ventral extradural defect. Most of the abnormal soft tissue in the ventral extradural space does not enhance. This is most compatible with a broad-based central to left paracentral disc herniation. He still has a disc herniation. There is right greater than left neural frontal encroachment. That's an L3, L4. Let's see what's cooking at L4, L5, which is the other level that was, uh, surgery was performed at. There is a large ventral extradural defect. This is most compatible 
with a broad-based central disc herniation at L4, L5. We still have the disc herniation. That was the whole point of the surgery, was to remove the disc material that was compressing the cardiac equipment, to free it up so the nerves had the opportunity to recover. Evidently, that, that wasn't done. There was flattening of the ventral aspect of the fecal sac. The fecal sac is what contains all of the motor and sensory nerves that enervate your lower extremities, your buttock, and your, um, your bladder. There is bilateral neural foramenal stenosis. They're still narrowing there, which is slightly improved, slightly improved when compared to the prior study. There's still compression, according to this MRI. What did the standard of care require of Dr. Lee at that point, after reviewing the MRI studies? Mr. Franklin had to go back to surgery. He had to go back and do a wider decompression so that we could give those nerves the best opportunity to recover. And according to Dr. Lee, that's a deviation from the standard of care. If he had been taken back to surgery, on April 8th, 2014, more likely than not, he would not have the persistent left foot drop that he has. He has to wear an AFO brace when he walks, and it causes um, great uh, uncomfortable um, discomfort for Mr. Franklin. It causes his gait to uh, be affected. on behalf of Dr. Lee for failing to recognize the significance of the MRI findings, the significance of his new finding of a left foot drop after surgery, and for not having taken Jason back to surgery. Dr. Lee continues to follow Jason after he's discharged from the virtual memorial, and he goes on to Martin Lee for a short stint. The only doctor in this entire case that says that Jason Franklin had unlikely caught it equina syndrome is Dr. Sanfilippo. He's the only one. If we want to believe his records. Dr. Sanfilippo. Unlikely CES. But who says other one? His partner, Dr. Lee. He says caught it in kind of syndrome. Who else? There's Dr. Keller, a neurologist who comes to see Jason after Dr. Lee's surgery and puts in his chart and his notes that Jason had caught it in kind of syndrome in the emergency department on April 4th. Everybody knew it. Everybody knew it or suspected it. Who else puts chronic equine syndrome as a diagnosis? Boy, you're going to see his records. He's the primary care physician. Dr. Asroff continues to follow him. Dr. Guinan is urologist, treating him for his sexual dysfunction. Dr. Polypshin, who is his gastroenterologist, who's treating him for his bowel dysfunction, for hemorrhoids that have developed, that have required surgical intervention because of his straining and inability to feel when he has to have a bowel movement. He has caught it equina syndrome in his chart. Dr. Slevin. Dr. Slevin is the pain management physician that Jason is under the care of. He's got caught it equina syndrome. We hope to call some of these people. Um, it's difficult to call them sometimes. I hope they're on a very busy um, work schedule, but we're going to try. They are providing care for Jason, for his permanent bowel and bladder dysfunction, his permanent loss of sensation, his 
neurogenic pain, his erectile dysfunction, and his loss of his motor function. The plaintiffs have, hi have hired experts to testify to some of the damages that Jason and Carolyn are claiming in this case as a result of the negligence of Dr. San Filippo and Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee, we're going to hear from him. And according to him, Dr. San Filippo deviated from the standard of care by failing to see Mr. Franklin in the emergency department on April 4th. By failing to recognize the signs and symptoms consistent with chronic equina syndrome, which required urgent, emergent surgical intervention. By failing to diagnose Mr. Franklin with chronic equina syndrome. By failing to surgically intervene in a timely fashion. And fail to recognize worsening of Mr. Franklin's medical condition on April 6th and the need for urgent, emergent surgical intervention. Dr. Regan is going to testify as far as Dr. Lee's deviations from the standard of care. According to Dr. Regan, he performed inappropriate surgery on April 7th, 2014, which exacerbated, made Mr. Franklin's condition worse. By not adequately decompressing his spine during the April 7th, 2014 surgery. By failing to recognize Mr. Franklin's worsening symptomatology post-operatively, requiring additional surgical intervention, and failing to perform additional decompression surgery. You're going to hear from Dr. Shekinas, the neuroradiologist that we hired, who is going to discuss the radiology aspects of the case, the MRI from April 4th, the MRI from April 8th. You're going to hear from Ellen Rader-Smith, who is an occupational therapist. She performs a functional capacity evaluation to assess Jason's ability to function. Dr. Gluck is a, does a vocational analysis for Jason Franklin. And Dr. Bialski, who is a chiropractic physician, certified rehabilitation counselor, and certified life care planner, who does a life care plan for Jason, about all the care and treatment that he's going to need for the rest of his life. And of course, you're going to hear from the defense. They've hired experts as well to support their defense in this case. Dr. Sanfilippo is expert. You're going to learn a lot about him. That he supports the fact that Mr. Franklin didn't have cardiac equine syndrome on April 4th, on April 5th, and April 6th. You're going to hear from Dr. Leeds, who's going to tell you that there was no deviation from the standard of care. Jason Franklin didn't need additional surgery on April 7th. And then you're going to hear from Carolyn and Jason and their 17 year old daughter, Jasanti. You're going to hear from some of the friends of Jason and Carolyn to discuss how this has affected their lives and will continue to affect their lives into the future. And the changes that they've seen from before the surgery to now. And how they are actually coping and dealing with this significant worldly change. We are confident, after hearing all the testimony, reviewing all the evidence in this case, and hopefully we're going to give you some of these medical records for the people, you will render a verdict in favor of Carolyn and Jason. You will have met how a verdict of proof will bring a will shift in favor of the Franklin's. And you will award monetary compensation to serve as justice for the Franklin family in light of the negligence of Dr. Sanfilippo and Dr. Lee. 